What is going on everybody? Welcome to the Big 12 Team Builder Dynasty week number 11 preview video. It's Wednesday. It's time for a preview. And we have some big matchups here coming up on Saturday. And what better way to talk about those matchups and get a reset button on what all that's going been going on in the Big 12 Team Builder Dynasty. We have a Madden update as well. We got a Vicente Galarza update with that court case and everything that's been going on with that and really trying to figure out who is that mastermind behind all of this Vicente Galarza stuff. And if you guys haven't been following that, please go follow Tom Roden 3 at Tom Roden 3 on Twitter. So before we get into that, let's get into some recruiting here for some of the top tier guys, some of the top line prospects, maybe even the custom recruits for all of the big 12. So we got Ryan Scott here leading the way, number one tackle, from Ohio, pretty much leaning towards Camu. We've talked about Camu at length. They are really going hard after tackles, after defensive linemen as well. They're trying to really build through the trenches. Bud Warner, head coach there, understands the importance of that. He's kind of left the program in a little bit of shambles at this point. He's a little bit older. He's probably retiring after this season, and he understands the, the importance of getting the trenches fixed and the trenches figured out because it's a very important part and integral part of foosball. Nayo Cotton leading the way for Nebraska State. And the bad thing for Nebraska State is that Odessa and McAllen, two other Texas powerhouses, including Texas down there, they're not even really interested in him at this point, but they could easily come in and swoop in there if Nebraska State can't seal the deal. So they're going to have to really go hard after Nihil Cotton to secure his services. Nathan Arbaugh starting to lead the way now with Ardmore. I believe he might have had a visit here last week. And he didn't. He didn't actually have a week visit out there. He's got a week 13 visit. And look at this. We get to schedule a visit for Nebraska State. And it's the only time that is available to do so is for week 15. And they have a very good advantage by scheduling him for week 15 plus 900. The problem here is, is that you've got that Ardmore visit for Nathan Arbaugh coming in week 13. So two weeks earlier than Nebraska State, that one hurts a little bit. So they're going to have to stay within the race for Nathan Arbaugh. It's going to be a big time get for Ardmore, but hopefully Nebraska State can stay within that race and, and grab that guy. Did you guys notice who I started off with this week? I started off with kind of the lovable losers. Just kidding. My brother's not here to defend himself. And Shreveport, I'm going to regret saying that because we're going to have to play them this week. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So Shreveport and Nebraska State, the, the little guys. The little guys, right? They're doing some good things because guess what? Antonio Miles Jr. is coming to Shreveport. Wow. That was huge. So Miles Jr., the number one strong safety. Remember when we were so negative on not being able to get this guy? It was looking really like it was going to be between Florida State and Tennessee. But Shreveport just swooped in and took control. They didn't even have a visit for Antonio Miles. That's insane. That's insane. So if we just look and see, he's an 80 right now, a gem, like, what happened? There was no extras whatsoever. And the plus change went from 3,000 up. I mean, this was crazy. So Antonio Miles commits to Shreveport. I think he just really saw the, the bigger picture, I guess you'd say. So he really likes the atmosphere in Shreveport. He likes what he's seen on TV and some primetime matchups. And you know what? It took that game against ACU in order to deliver the final blow to Tennessee and Florida State and say, nope, I'm going with those black uniforms. I'm going where where they really enjoy football down there and party at the Shreve. I think Miles Jr. is going to be a really good player out at the Shreve. And that's, that's just really surprising, really surprising. I know we broke the lock last week to get Miles Jr. in here. I didn't think it was going to have that much of an effect. That's, that's huge. But Mike Hall leading the way with Shreveport there. They're starting to get... A lot of traction and maybe not so much with Jarvis Humphrey and shout out here to Crate Games yet again make sure you guys go check out his channel link is in the description for Jarvis Humphrey 
update videos of gameplay of this recruit. That's actually his recruit. He put this guy in, and there you go. He's down 1,255, considering Shreveport, McAllen, and LSU. The problem is with Mr. Humphrey is we got to wait till week 13, and I just don't know if he's going to last that long. I've seen crazier things happen with <laughs> Miles Jr. Maybe something happens with like that with Jarvis Humphrey, but I don't know. It's not looking like that's going to be very likely. Darius Davis, we talked about him getting recruited over. Uh, Kyle Daly, we could probably take this guy off the board. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. But they're getting some pretty darn good recruits in here. And <laughs> boom, goes the dynamite guy. You guys remember that guy? Hello, everyone. Steven Jackson's David... Later, he gets the rebound, passes it to the man, shoots it, and boom goes the dynamite. The Associated Press of the All-American First Team in College ba Baseball was announced today at Utah's seven-foot sophomore center Andrew Bogot was the leading vote getting, receiving 61st place votes. Bogot, who is an Australian native, received very little attention in the presentation in the preseason, but averaged 20 points and 12 rebounds a game for Utah. The four other players joining Bogot on the AP team are senior forward Wayne Summers in Kansas of Kansas and Hacken Warwick of Syracuse. Hacken Warwick? I'll post that video in, in the comment section below. But Hakeem Booker, 6'4", 215, 67 overall player. Yeah, this is looking like a pretty good one too. Maybe we can swoop in and steal him from Washington State. Turn the page here to Ardmore. We got a couple custom recruits that we can follow. Taylor Mickens has a visit this week. I don't know if, I mean, he's locked us out, so I don't know if that's going to end up uh, paying any sort of dividend. But we've got some custom guys on our list. We got Danny Monroe still in the lead, considering Ardmore, Midland States, Amarillo, Odessa, all within triple digits there. So no lead is safe at this point if you're Ardmore. If you, if you like these other guys, if you like Amarillo, Odessa, Midland State, you're in the mix for the number one defensive end. And that's going to be pretty, pretty huge. I mean, the guy's 6'3", 271. He's basically J.J. Watt. Basically J.J. Watt. Kentrell Huggins got a huge boost from Camu. It's going to be really interesting to see where he decides to go. And does he have any visits upcoming? He has all team builder all the way. So Camu this week. McAllen next week, and Ardmore week 13. I don't know if that's going to last. I really, really don't. Hopefully it does. Hopefully we can just hold on for a little bit longer, but I don't think it's going to last, guys. And then Demarion Foreman, we know we know the deal with Demarion Foreman. He's had Alabama on his list of schools to go to ever since he was a baby coming out of Alabama, Hoover, Alabama, and he's got a visit with them coming up this week. So that's going to be a tough sell. It's going to be tough to just see uh, if, if he's going to decide to go to team builder schools or he's going to go to a traditional powerhouse. CJ Jones here, we're down by 750 to Wake Forest and USC. We talked about Ryan Scott. We talked about Nathan Arbaugh. Scott Campbell's been on that list for quite some time. This guy, David Dickerson, that, he would have been really cool to, to unlock and break the lock, but we just can't seem to get him. Jim Martin, we're making a push. We're making a push on Mr. Jimmy here. David Parrish, we're well in the lead for, for him and his services out of Hawaii. And then Jordan Lashley, oof, down by 1,100. And really the only the only guys that are going to be able to try to nab him is going to be ACU and Little Rock. Other than that, you know, things are looking pretty decent here for Ardmore. I mean, we're getting guys like Robert Rivero, David Payne, Oliver Price we're making moves on. Uh, David Price's brother, Mateo Garcia, again, still looking like McAllen and LSU. And Taylor Mickens, we talked about him. I don't know, 4,400 points, and he's got a visit coming up with us. I don't know, guys. I don't know. I don't think that that's going to I don't think that's gonna happen. And, of course, because Broken Arrow is so god-awful, they're terrible this season, we got to look at the recruiting board and see what's going to be the plan, what's, what's going to happen in the future. Right, so let's take a look and see what we've got going on for Broken Arrow this week in recruiting. Demarion Forma, we just talked about Demarion. 
835 points down to Bama. If, he, if we can hold on, just hold on. After this week, if he doesn't commit, that's going to give Broken Arrow another shot at it. Just extend that out a little bit longer. But Braxton Austin, we broke the lockdown for Braxton Austin Jr. for Uba, and now they're trailing Denver Tech by 350, and he actually does not have a visit scheduled. So that's going to be the really tough part. But you know what? The good thing for Broken Arrow is Arkansas State, Texas, and Utah State all have visits, but other than Texas, those other teams are not going to be able to catch him. So that's the big get for Braxton Austin right there. Brent Smith, a defensive tackle, down to Georgia by 690. Joe Garrett, so they're focusing a little bit on defense, kind of like the Camu approach right here. A lot of defensive ends, defensive linemen, and guard play, offensive linemen. Like, it's a pretty decent list for Uba and Stephen Williams, the number 13 wide receiver out of Ohio. Actually, number 13 wide receiver total, but a four-star receiver out of Ohio. Looking like he's going to be pretty decent, but they got they got to get a quarterback. And I know Chad Masterson is on is on the come up a little bit, but um, you know maybe he's maybe he's going to work out. We'll see. We'll see what happens next season. He's probably going to end up being the starter next year, I would assume. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with Uba. they got a lot of work left to do here. Just one class is not going to push him over the top, I don't think. Camus seems to be killing it right now on the recruiting trail in Bud Warner's last season. We talked about during the early parts of this season how you know there was a lot of uncertainty with a lot of these recruits trying to get recruited by Kansas a and And they weren't really sure about what was going to happen. You know, what's... What's the deal, bud? We know you're going to retire, but you know who's going to be the next guy in line, right? We just don't know. We're not sure if we want to commit to the program because it's just so uncertain. How's that going to affect my year of eligibility? You know, I don't want to transfer out of Camu based on you not being the coach next season. Well, they got a ton of visits coming up this week, including Kentrell Huggins, Oliver Price, some custom recruits there, and uh, they're doing really well. Actually, they're doing they're doing really well, as you guys can see. Talked about Huggins down by 150. Anthony Nelson was a big get, number two defensive tackle out of Florida. Cameron Shelnut, the number four tackle in the mix for guard. Joe Taylor, the number two in pass block. Number one, Ryan Scott. Scott Powell here. They could still make a big time push as they have a week 11 visit. He's already getting a plus 800. On top of that, they might get more bonuses onto that and catch UL Monroe. I mean, this. This swan song, I guess you'd say, for Bud Warner is uh, going pretty decent. I mean, Derek Burns, a leader type of player at the linebacker spot ahead of all other teams as Cam was in first place here. Quarterback Donald Rogers. We probably should put more points on Donald Rogers. Maybe I can find somewhere where we can, uh, can do that. So, yeah, that lead here, 1,500 by P.J. McKinnon or McKeon. Let's do that. Let's put those points back on to McKeon there. So, Donald Rogers... Scrambler, 6'1", four-star. We could use him. And last but not least in the recruiting for today, we're going to look at ACU, the subscriber team. And they've got a ton, a ton of visits here in week number 11. And the reason why we're going to take a look at ACU and like why we like to look at ACU is because all these freshmen that are coming in, we get to rename all these freshmen that aren't currently custom recruits, such as Jordan Lashley. If he ended up committing to ACU, we're not going to rename him anyway because he's a custom guy. But guys like Gerald Frederick, Tony Powers, Mike Davis, all these guys we can rename because they're incoming freshmen. And this is your team. The ACU Spartans are your team. Kevin Davis. You know, I looked and I could try to see if I could unlock these guys and break down that door. And it just wasn't going to happen. So Tony Powers has locked him out. Does he have a visit upcoming? Yes. He's in week 11. Kevin Davis does not have a visit upcoming, so we are going to remove Kevin Davis off of the board, and we're going to fill that a little bit later. You know what time it is. Time for top 25 here, guys. Clemson moves to the number one spot due to the Ardmore loss. So this is the first time ever in Coach Stephen Cust's career, his head coaching career, He's been rated number one. 
Remember, he used to be the coach for the Nebraska State Prairie Dogs. And we can just see the team schedule here once again for Clemson. And they're winning some close games here as of late to ranked opponents. Florida State, Wake Forest. Wake Forest playing really good, actually, 31-24. to Yeah, I mean, some people, like I mentioned before, could argue their strength to schedule here early on. But it's still the ACC, and they're still getting it done. And they've moved themselves to 9-0. and You can't really argue with that, especially when we're looking at, like, Penn State, Tennessee, and then Shreveport. You're not going to give a number one rating to Shreveport quite yet. There's still some question marks there for the Shreve. But they are the considered the best team in the Big 12 right now ahead of Denver Tech. They're getting more votes than Denver Tech is. And I think that that's only because, A... They don't have a loss, and B, they beat the team that Denver Tech lost to, which would have been Ardmore. But kind of cool to see that a bunch of Big 12 teams here just vying for top five position. You've got six teams vying for top five position, so it's pretty cool. It's it's a bloodbath right now in the East. I mean, look at the Eastern teams: Little Rock, McAllen, Ardmore, and then Shreveport. It's crazy right now. Four of the six top 10 teams are from the Big 12 East. It's just nuts. Rutgers moving to 6-3 and three after a win over Ohio State. And they moved into the top 10. Pretty crazy. Florida and Michigan always seem to be tied at the hip. As of late, ACU moves from 10 to 13 with the loss at the hands of Shreveport. And just rounding out the top 25 here, we have Nebraska State at number 19 and California moving from unranked to number 25 additionals receiving votes we don't have any big 12 team builder teams receiving any more votes Heisman watch Alex Makovich in the lead and nothing really changed for him he's just been hold and serve and Mr. Steady the whole way through 30 of 42 347 and two touchdowns I mean, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? He is the guy. He's the guy in Denver Tech. He's the Heisman front runner. It seems like the only people that can win Heismans in this Big 12 are people from Denver Tech in that highlighter yellow. I guess they just stand out to the voters. Chester Hall with Stephen Cust. We know Stephen Cust loves his running backs. He had some good running backs out at Nebraska State, too. And it's still going to be the remaining the same thing. 29 carries, 159, and two scores, leading the victory over Wake Forest. Chris Robeson out of Oklahoma, moving on up after a four-touchdown performance. Seidel Riggins had a great game. 28 carries, 115-2. and two. He's got Andre Wingo written all over him, guys. I mean, look at what he's been able to do right now. 924 yards so far this season, but he's been a 1,200-yard runner every single season, and he's, he had 1,600 rushing yards last year. It's It's crazy. It's crazy what he's been able to do, and even the receiving numbers are fairly decent. More that power runner, but still, you know, he's going to be well on his way and well on that mark to reaching another 1,000-yard rushing season. Maybe not as much as he had in 16 or 15, just because we do have some more games left to play, but Shreveport's been more pass, more pass-minded uh, as of late with Rashid Davis, something that they haven't had an extra dimension with. Um, in a long, long time. Andres Buckley, 100 yards of rushing, three touchdowns, 39 yards receiving against Amarillo. And we just look at his stats real quick. He, so he's reached the 1,000-yard mark, really the mark that you want to get to as a running back. And he looks like he's going to outpace uh, his rushing yards from last season. Already in double digits in touchdowns, but with 12. When we look at receiving three so he's already outperforming last season's numbers. I think he's definitely, definitely still a Heisman candidate. Players of the week, no surprise here. Grayson Stanfield in the loss. I think the overtime numbers padded this a little bit, but seven total touchdowns, only 16 incompletions, over 450 yards passing. I think you got to give it to him. I mean, yeah, your team played in overtime and you started pad some stats, but it's a shortened field, and all the damage was pretty much done throughout the regulation time but Grayson Stanfield winning NCAA honors 
in week 10. Defensive tackle for Nebraska State against Odessa was a man amongst boys in that game. 28 to 27 victory, three sacks, four tackles for losses, and a forced fumble. I mean, that's a great game. That's a really, really great game. I don't think anything changes if you go to the Big 12. It doesn't. But there you are. There's your Big 12 and NCAA Players of the Week. It's about that time, guys. We get a Madden update. And through six weeks of the regular season, the Miami Dolphins, all game simulated, by the way, are 6-0. Judd Carmichael having himself a great season. However, he's hurt. He's hurt. Was injured just last week in the win with a shoulder tear. And it happens to be his throwing shoulder is torn. So he's going to be out for three weeks. What does this mean for the Miami Dolphins? Well, they have a rookie quarterback that they drafted when we auto-drafted. And he's not that good. He's not that good. And knowing Jeff Henderson, he loves his team builder type of players. So he is going to go after a few certain Big 12 former athletes at quarterback namely Marcus Rodriguez from the free agents he's gonna go out and sign Marcus Rodriguez however he started practicing and they didn't like what they saw from Marcus Rodriguez they felt like he was definitely a seriously 70 overall quarterback that he was not ready to take a 6-0 team for three weeks so they actually went out and they got Cade Wilson from the Washington Redskins, who, by the way, have Phillip Rivers at the helm, Alex Smith as the backup, and then Cade Wilson as the third stringer. And why Cade Wilson? Well, because he used to be an Art Moore quarterback, very familiar with Jeff Henderson's offense that he ran out in Art Moore, Oklahoma, for the Thunderwolves in the Big 12. So he's very familiar with Cade Wilson, and he's going to go after him and trade for him. And we're going to go ahead and trade Lavert Hill straight up. So a young corner for a young quarterback. And I think with Cade Wilson at a 74 overall, I think he's going to be our backup quarterback to Judd Carmichael going forward. We really haven't addressed the backup quarterback position behind Carmichael since he came in here. And we've been rotating through veterans like Eli Manning. We've got Dungy from Syracuse that hasn't really panned out either. We're going to go actually go ahead and release him, too. It just didn't really add up to have a 66 overall quarterback uh, backing up your 81. So we're going to let Cade Wilson be the backup to Jed Carmichael. So they're going to have to get past their year one type of angst because McAllen in that overtime game beat us and beat Cade Wilson. It sucked. It sucked. So we lost that game. I don't like it. And uh, Jeff Henderson has a lot of fond memories of that game. I, I know it for sure. And what's interesting is that Vicente Galarza actually was playing in that game. So obviously there's some ties there. Henderson, Galarza, Cade Wilson, Carmichael, Brock Musselman. You guys get the idea there. So after this Madden update, we'll get an update as to far as far as that Vicente Galarza type of deal here. So let's get into some gameplay now. 6-0 Dolphins against the Tennessee Titans. Hopefully, Cade Wilson had a good week of practice and he's ready to take this team on and advance the Dolphins to 7-0. That would be one heck of a regular season start. So guys, let's get this thing underway. Quick highlights, here we go. Tennessee already up to the 19 yard line and they are gonna be firing for that first down marker on a third and six. They get past the line, but Matthews comes backwards and Todd Parker Comes through with the big time tackle there to stop them short. It's going to lead to a Tennessee field goal for the first points in today's action. So here's Cade Wilson. Here's Cade Wilson. And you know, he has not gotten into a starting position. He's mostly been just that backup type of guy behind Alex Smith and now Phillip Rivers. But now trading for him, this is his first NFL career start. And he's feeling pretty comfortable already in this Ardmore, Jeff Henderson type of offense. And I like what I'm seeing out of Mr. Number Nine there, Cade Wilson. Here's a pass, going to go a little bit, a little bit wide for Odell Beckham, and that's going to end up and not pleasing the head coach there. So they're going to have to settle for a field goal. Nine to three game as Tennessee now has two more field goals added onto it. Jump ball here to Odell Beckham, and you know, if you're Cade Wilson and you're jumping into a situation, you've got Odell Beckham as your top target. 
as a wide receiver, you got a pretty good situation right there. So here's A.J. Derby wide open on that streak. Wilson's going to find him. Here's Wingo following his run blocking. He's going to get about seven there. He's going to get up to the six-yard line. Third and three. Wilson firing out to Drakeen and Timmons, and he had it. He just dropped it. That's been a recurring theme for Drakeen. And Henderson's like, get this guy out of here. Get this guy out of here. We can't have him in the slot. It's just not working out here. But look at this play by former McAllen safety Ty Underwood. And that's got to please the head coach, and he's just got that swag. He's like, nope, nope, nothing. Nothing on me all day, all day, all night. Odell Beckham here with this drag, and he's going to get all the way from 37 to the 24. A little bit later on here at the three-yard line, Cade Wilson with a little play-action rollout, and oh, what a job by Odell Beckham to stop his momentum from hitting out of bounds and coming back in and making this touchdown reception. So a little bit later, 25-13, Miami had actually taken the lead at that point, but now 25-13, and what an effort by Paris McMillan, the former McAllen wide receiver, hooking up with Cade Wilson here. I mean, that's crazy that he was able to shove off all those tacklers and reach for the end zone and get in. A little bit later, 25 to 20. We are now in the fourth quarter at the very start of it, guys. And Kay Wilson's trying to find something, a little extra something to push this Dolphins team over the top here in this game against Tennessee. Wingo trying to power through. He's only going to get two third and one situation. It's a big down here because a touchdown will put you up by two points. No, field goal will draw you closer, but you need a touchdown. So 750, empty back set, and pass deep to Marlon Swift. This guy out of Midland State has caught so many deep passes from various quarterbacks at Midland State, and he's doing it yet again here in Miami. Miami's going to take the lead now, 26 to 25, but it looks like we have a holding call because the play continued, and it was in the middle of the play the flag was thrown. And the two-point would have been good had no hold occurred. So Bo Benshaw going to move him back to, at the 12-yard line. Wilson firing out to Paris McMillan again. They're going to give him the spot for the two-point conversion. So now Miami finds themselves up by three points. And now Tennessee is at the five-yard line with four minutes to go. And wide open is Michael Roberts for the touchdown. Underwood with the tackle, but he just couldn't get it in time. And now we're going to watch Miami's possession here to try to get the lead back on a touchdown. And uh-oh, this isn't good. A sack is going to lead to third and 18, and Wilson, who was just brought in a week ago, is going to have to exit this game. So now we're going to watch Marcus Rodriguez. You guys remember, we picked him up in the free agents out of McAllen. And that's a really pretty throw right here. He's going to pick up the first down, firing deep out. Here to Timmons, and yet again, Timmons can't haul it in. But that was a very well-placed ball by Marcus Rodriguez. So you gotta, you got to give your receiver a chance. I think he did that. Second and 10 here at the 35, and a little touch pass to Mike Gusecki right in the middle of some traffic. So Marcus Rodriguez is looking pretty good and really comfortable so far in this offense. I like what I'm seeing here. It's a pass complete to Paris McMillan. It makes one man miss from the 20-yard line to the 11, so a gain of nine. Second and one now. Looks like we're going to hand the ball off to Logan Sweeney, the Odessa State running back. And I think maybe if he cut left a little bit, he might have had a good shot at a touchdown, maybe lower the shoulder a little bit. But, you know, hey, hindsight is often 20-20. So here's Marcus Rodriguez and the Dolphins at the five-yard line and escaping pressure and throwing on the run. He's going to connect with Mike Gusecki. And now the Dolphins guys are up 34-32. to And now we have to go for... The extra point, and yes, the extra point was missed. The extra point was missed, and now that Tennessee is driving, they're actually trying to score a touchdown versus trying to get a field goal. Pretty crazy. So we tried to let him score on a previous play there. You guys saw it. User control just did not want to tackle him, but CPU tackled him anyway. They're going to get this field goal up and good, and now they're up by one point. So yes, the extra point being missed is become vital right here right now so let's try to drive down the football field with Marcus Rodriguez I mean we're down to we're down to a skeleton crew at quarterback right now it's not looking very good but here is 
A pass almost going to get caught out there by Beckham, but 10 seconds left to go. Third and 10. Rodriguez dropping back. Doesn't seem like he's got anybody open and just not in time anyway. Had he even gotten rid of the football, just not going to be in time as he gets sacked. So 35-34, four seconds to go. Got to throw this Hail Mary and a bad job of pass protection there is going to cause Marcus Rodriguez to get sacked and the Dolphins are no longer undefeated. So, you know, hats off to Jeff Henderson and trying to bring two quarterbacks in that he's familiar with, try to get this job done to stay undefeated, but uh, didn't get it done. Didn't get it done today. Defense did not play very well. I thought Cade Wilson was admirable in today's game. No turnovers. We really didn't run the football. Maybe that's probably why we lost, especially with a second-tier type of quarterback like Cade Wilson. Yeah, he played pretty good, but I don't think you want Cade Wilson like driving your offense. Maybe we should have focused on Andre Wingo a little bit more. But, uh, you know, looking at the stats, it looks like Cade Wilson and Marcus Rodriguez played pretty decently in this offense. Wingo only 11 attempts rushing. Receiving-wise, Mike Gusecki led the way with 75 yards on seven receptions. He only led in receptions, I should say. I should correct myself there. But Beckham led in yards with over 120. And then we see that Ty Underwood had seven total tackles with a tackle for a loss and a pass defended, so he played very, very well. So that's going to be it, guys, for our Madden update. Let's go ahead and talk about some Vicente Galarza news. We got breaking news here from Tom Roden. You guys can follow Tom Roden, the Big 12 Team Builder reporter, at Tom Roden 3 And here's the breaking news. In case you missed the news, as I'm reading this verbatim from what he has here. Legal teams, oh, there's a typo. Legal teams have been assembling, hence, no major updates in the past few weeks to prepare for a long and lengthy battle against Vicente Galarza and his lawyer, Paul Goldstein. Claims against Amarillo head coach Brock Musselman and the surprise name being former Ardmore head coach Jeff Henderson, who we literally just saw in the Madden update. More to come in the coming days as the court date is being set up for the 13th of November. That's actually next week. Smack dab in the middle of the season. So how does Henderson fit into all of this? And why is his name even being called upon? In case you guys have missed it, you guys can catch up by go following Tom Roden 3 on Twitter. But in case you guys have needing to catch up here, take a look at the pinned comment that I posted below and you guys will be able to, to catch up on everything that's gone on. But for the most part, what we figured out is that Vicente Galarze, former McAllen product, a former McAllen defensive tackle, defensive end, basically just a defensive lineman who now plays for the New York Jets, well, no longer because he's arrested, was getting into some trouble while at McAllen. There's a lot of complaints that were filed about him, Brock Musselman brushed these under the rug until there was one really bad complaint that he had to file to the compliance department. Everything came back clean, everything came back fine. What was that complaint? Well, the complaint was actually made by Danny Booker's father. So former Odessa quarterback Danny Booker, his father reported Vicente Galarza for trying to coax his son, Danny Booker, into a money-making scheme to try and throw the matchup between McAllen and Odessa in year number three. Well, that didn't end up happening because Danny Booker denied to take part in it. However, Danny Booker being the type of guy that doesn't want any confrontation, he didn't report it. His dad did. So now that that got the ball rolling, people started asking questions about Brock Musselman. Why is a player of his being accused of possibly throwing football games? When Galarza was arrested, the first thing he said was, quote, unquote, Musselman knows. And the whole world went crazy trying to figure out what does that even mean? Musselman knows what? Well, at the time of Galarza's arrest, we know that Musselman's no longer at McAllen University. He left before potentially getting fired due to being on the hot seat to Amarillo University. But the one thing that seems to be getting lost in all of this is the fact that Vicente Galarza was spotted by Danny Booker with a player, presumably a player, that we now know the identity of. They were spotted with a red coupe. 
And that license plate on the very back of it was BA5 dollar sign TAR. What does that mean? Nobody's really figured it out yet. However, we do know that Vicente Galarza owned that red coupe with that license plate. That coupe ended up being found in El Paso, Texas. The very same week, guys, that UTEP, which is from El Paso, were playing in Amarillo, where Brock Musselman coaches. But the key question is, because that doesn't seem like that's a connection, but the key question is who was driving the car? Who was operating the vehicle? The vehicle is owned by Vicente Galarza. Who was operating it? Because Vicente is in jail right now. He's being held. It was operated by Odessa State five-star running back, former five-star running back, Jimmy Brown. The same week that Jimmy Brown had to leave for personal reasons, that car is now crashed in El Paso, Texas. When El Paso traveled to Amarillo to play against them. So is this just a way of Vicente Galarza telling his associate, Jimmy Brown, to say, hey, crash this car in El Paso. Hopefully, the feds or whoever's involved here kind of come up with a connection here with this red car, me, and Brock, Musselman. Keep in mind, it's a little bit of a stretch because we don't have all the information, we don't have all the details, but keep in mind, in year number three, when Danny Booker was approached by Vicente Galarza later on in the season, this is the same season, this is the same year, year three, where UTEP actually hosted in El Paso, Amarillo, and Odessa State in back-to-back -back weeks. So why is the city of El Paso very, very important? That much we don't know quite yet. All we know is that in back-to-back -back weeks, Amarillo in year three visited UTEP and Odessa State the following week visited UTEP. Why are those things connected? Well, that's left for another day to figure out because Obviously, I am trying to help you guys figure this mystery out in this Vicente Galarza case because at the very end of it, there's some jaw-dropping news for the Big 12. I can promise you that. So, guys, that's going to be it for the Vicente Galarza case today. I would love to know what your guys' thoughts are or your predictions about what's going to end up happening. Who do you think is really at fault here? What do you think the license plate means? Who do you think is telling Jimmy Brown what the heck to do? Right now, to go make sure that this case is left covered up and all the all the loose ends are tied up because they don't want to be like Vicente. Do, are you on Team Vicente Glars? Do you think he's actually innocent? Do you think Brock Musselman is framing him? Or do you think Musselman is the man who's innocent behind all this stuff that's going on? So I'd love to know what your guys' thoughts are. Leave them in the comment section below. Let's actually go ahead now and get into some pick previews for week number 11. All right, guys, time to get in some pick previews now that this is kind of I don't know, a little bit more lighthearted now because that Galarza stuff is a little bit depressing, wouldn't you say? All right, so Little Rock taking on ACU here, the number nine team in the nation. Little Rock 6-2 and two, off an emotional win against Ardmore last week, dropping Ardmore from the number one spot to the number seven spot, winning 62-59. to 59. And the big thing here is the defense. Where's the defense gone? Ever since Big 12 play happened, the defense has struggled mightily giving up 31 points to Nebraska State, giving up 46 points to Lamont Christian and Broken Arrow, and then 45 points to McAllen, and then the overtime game against Ardmore. Is that going to happen against ACU? I think it's going to. I'm actually going to take ACU in this game because I think that they have more talent, and I think that maybe that defense was just a paper tiger, looked more fearsome than it actually is for Little Rock. I hate saying it just because, well, it's Little Rock, and I really want Gunnar Rivers to win this game against ACU. Not that I hate ACU, your subscriber team out there. I just think that they could really use that momentum, that emotional W, to get this win against ACU. It is on the road, and that's something else that we have to consider. So I'm actually going to take ACU. I just think that they're better overall team, top to bottom. 
and I think that they're actually going to get this W. All right, next up we have Nebraska State against Kansas A&M, and kind of two quarterbacks, the tale of two quarterbacks here that just don't seem to really do well under pressure, Shinosky and Jace Freeman. Now Nebraska State is finding themselves at 6-2 and two mark, can move 4-4 four and four at 1-3 and three in conference play, and I, I think I trust Shinosky more than Jace Freeman. Jace Freeman always seems to screw up and do something wacky, do something weird. Yeah, they got a better defense, but I think that the user team is going to figure this out, and they do have some big-time prospects coming in. I think Nebraska State's going to find a way to get this W, so bank on Nebraska State. They're going to get it done. Next up, we got Shreveport and Ardmore. You could either go one or two ways with this. Actually, you might even be able to go both ways with this. I don't know who to pick in this game. I really don't because when you look at the last game against Little Rock that we lost in overtime, a gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching loss, we could not stop the run. What does Shreveport like to do? They love to run the football. They've also got a really good quarterback now in Rasheed Davis that can sling it any time that they want to which makes them even more difficult to stop and even more non-one-dimensional. Look at the turnover differential. Nine. Stanfield and this Ardmore offense cannot turn the football over. We cannot do that. If we do that, we probably are going to lose the game. On the flip side, if you look at Ardmore, you might look at it and think that loss against Little Rock was kind of a fluke. Maybe you could, th you could say that. I could see how you could think that. Just because we know that we have a good team. But do we match up well against Shreveport? That's the, that's the question. Shreveport is built very much like Little Rock in the fact they have a good quarterback, they have a good running game. It's pretty solid defensively. Notice how I said solid defensively, not super amazing defensively as we saw with Little Rock earlier on in the season. But Shreveport kind of is that team of destiny right now. And Ardmore has to really find themselves at this point. Former national champions of last season Kind of find themselves in a little bit of a hole. Not a big hole, but a little bit of a hole. Losing to Shreveport almost guarantees that you're not winning the Big 12 East Division. You're not going to get back to a championship game. So this game means a lot. It's at home. Ardmore doesn't really lose at home. You could swing it that way too. There's a lot of different angles that you could take with this, but I'm going to take Ardmore. I think we're going to get the W. I think we match up better against Shreveport. I think Little Rock is a little more talented. Next up, we have Denver Tech, the number five team in the nation, taking on Odessa State and having to travel to Texas. But I don't think this is much of a matchup here, guys. I think that maybe Odessa State's offense can kind of hang with Alex Makovich in the front runner for the Heisman Trophy. But let's be honest, it's Denver Tech. And every time we put them on upset alert, they always seem to come through. And Odessa State has yet to win a single conference game. They've lost to Ardmore by two touchdowns, by 14. Lost to Amarillo by seven. Lost to Midland State by 14. And lo then lost to Nebraska State by one. So it seems to go in this familiar pattern. Double-digit loss, single-digit loss. Double-digit loss, single-digit loss. I think coming off a single-digit loss, they're going to have another double-digit loss. And this one might not even be close. I'm taking Denver Tech. Next matchup here, number eight against number six, Midland State. I'm going to go ahead and take Midland State in this one. I don't really, I'm not a firm believer in McAllen. I know that Midland State never seems to come through in the clutch. I think that that might have a possibility of continuing here. I don't know. It's, it's really tough. It's really tough for me. But that offense for McAllen is something special. That defense for Midland State is going to have to be on their toes. They're going to have to be ready. It's going to be a good game. I will say that much. It's going to be a good game. They have Danny Monroe and Justin Samuel coming in for a visit. And if they play well defensively, they could end up signing both of those guys on the same day. They could be looking at each other like, hey, man, you're like really good. I know you're really good, too. You want to team up? You want to team up? You want to do this little power couple thing? I think that that might happen. Both guys from Texas, two teams from Texas playing here, McAllen and Midland. I'm going to take Midland State with McAllen go on the road. I trust it. Maybe I might regret it. I, I hate taking Midland State in anything anymore. Next up, we got Amarillo and Uba. This is tough for me because Uba's offense is kind of starting to come around just a little bit. They're the number 19 team in the country. And with Lamont Christian out, they've got Buster Smith that they're relying on. And he's actually been holding his own a little bit, but that turnover differential is kind of hurting them at negative six. 
I think Amarillo just has way too many weapons on offense between Keon Sykes, Ezekiel Henry, Ryan Bradshaw, Quanquan Alexander. It just doesn't stop for them. I think that this is going to be a shootout type of game, and I think it's going to go the way of Amarillo. So guys, that's actually going to be it for today's preview video. Leave a like if you like this thing, and make sure you guys are getting your picks in before Saturday morning hits. I think that that's when we're going to actually get the video uploaded. If it is not uploaded on Saturday morning, please check back in the community tab. I will make sure that I let you guys know when that video is going to post. We may do another premiere at 8 o'clock, 8.30-ish on Saturday night after all the college football games have concluded. So guys, make your picks. Click on that form below to make your picks, and I will see you on Saturday. Leave a like if you like this thing, and I'll see you then. As always, peace.